and we expect to launch uh, about six topics a year for the next couple of years. Uh, in this first year, we're focusing mostly on mathematics, uh, but in future years, we'll focus on science, arts, and humanities. Uh, in each of these topics, uh, the, the idea is to pick a creative challenge that we face here at Pixar, and then explain how academic concepts are used to address that challenge. So for instance, in the environment modeling topic, students will learn how the, the blades of grass in Brave were made using parabolic arcs. And parabolas are something that, you know, eighth and ninth graders study, but they don't really
explain some of the concepts. And students have access to those same interactive programs. So here's the one that deals with linear interpolation. Uh, we want to get the kids being content creators as early as possible. And so this is you know, part of the lesson one uh, principle is to keep the material kind of uh, geometric and design oriented before we dive into the math in part two. Now after this video, uh, Rob goes on to build on the idea of linear interpolation to introduce the Bezier curves that we actually use uh, most often here at Pixar. And again, there's another interactive to help explain what Bezier curves are and to give uh, students uh, an intuitive feeling for how to deal with them. Um, and uh, this is an example of, a, of an open-ended exercise where you know, students can spend as much or as little time uh, making the ball do whatever they feel like it should do. Okay? So <clears throat> that's, the progr that's more or less how lesson one progresses. And once the student is done animating, if they ever finish, uh, <laughs> they can move on to the second lesson where you know, we reveal the underlying mathematics. Now, let me just back up here. <coughs> Our second, the mathematic, the lesson focused on mathematics always start with a lesson briefing. And this lesson briefing very briefly outlines what we're about to cover. And in this case, it's the mathematics behind that Bezier curve. How is the computer generating that curve? Um, and in these briefings, we also identify any prerequisites you need before starting. And those links take you either to Pixar content or directly to Khan Academy. So you don't have to go anywhere, which is nice. And below that, for teachers, we have grade level standards along with detailed mappings to the Common Core standards if you're looking for that. A lot of the mathematics lessons, too, are, are graded for different ages. So some of the lessons are targeted more to seventh and eighth grade, some are targeted more to upper level high school. So <clears throat> it pains me to do this, to jump into lessons and skip things, but because we don't have time, We'll just quickly demo you know, two of the math exercises and, and what do these look like. So we actually begin by returning to linear interpolation. And in this case, we connect linear interpolation to the slope-intercept formula, which is something that every student practically confronts in school. Um, and again, I'm jumping ahead, which kills me. Um, <laughs> we eventually get to Bezier curves. But because Bezier curves are a little bit more advanced, you know, we have a softer start. And we use a lot of interactive exercises for this. In this case, we want the student to develop a geometric understanding behind what's going on here. So this exercise is asking me to actually complete this equation. Um, so you see the progression here where we motivate the curves, we get students using the curves, and then we reveal the underlying mathematics. And, and this is the flow we follow in every topic. This is a good example of the fact that we're not slapping on linear interpolation you know, to some random word problem. You know, this is an authentic use of interpolation in what we do every, year, every uh, day here at Pixar. And it turns out Bezier curves build on linear interpolation or kind of repeated linear interpolation. Not something you typically see in school, but perfectly accessible and, and absolutely relevant to what we do. So in this, in this first year, uh, we really focused on the individual learner. But in future years, we'd really like to work with uh, teachers and school districts to try to adapt the material that we've created already for use in the classroom and to help steer uh, material that we'll be creating um, coming up, to, again, to use in the classroom. We'll be collecting qualitative and quantitative feedback along the way with hopes of continuously improving this content and expanding this content. So please, if you have any feedback, suggestions, not only of what we built, but what we could build, please reach out to us. Uh, the email is here. It is PIAB at comicademy.org. And again, we really look forward to hearing from you because we're learning as we go. Thank you. Thank you. Conversation about what's truly at the heart of this project, education and creativity. Folks, welcome, Sarah. Inspiring. I, I, we didn't have this introduction. It's incredible reach. My 
Yeah, the numbers probably change. Depends. Depends. Yeah, September is going to be a big month for us. So yeah, we're, we're probably going to cross 20 million students in September. 20 million students are, are doing something. Is that every week, or every month? What's That's going to be 20 million in the month of September. Oh, right. Okay. It's it's really incredible. Uh, and this started because you were helping somebody. Yeah, as 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 Britt mentioned, I was a um, I, in my day job. I was an analyst in an investment firm. But my twelve year old cousin Nadia needed help with math. She was in New Orleans. I started tutoring her remotely over the phone. And the first contact was actually all about the interactive stuff. It wasn't about videos. I thought you know hey, that that seems you know kind of low tech. Uh, but then um, after you know I, I started tutoring her. That worked out well. Then. Uh, started tutoring her younger brothers, and then word got around the family that free tutoring was going on. <laughs> and I, um, I was having trouble scaling up the, the lessons, and a friend suggested, why don't you make video lessons of, of, what, of some of the concepts, and I thought it was a, it was a horrible idea, and, and YouTube's for cats playing piano. And <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I did it, and, and you know, I, I was just telling you this earlier, but, and it's, you know, some people think it's apocryphal, right? but it's true. You know, I asked my cousins for feedback, and they said they liked me better on YouTube than in person. So I, uh, I kept going, and then it was clear people weren't. My cousins were watching, and uh, you know, one thing led to another. Um, but as Britt showed, you know, our, our the whole point of Khan Academy actually, that its roots were even pre-videos around can you create interactive um, platforms for people to actually uh, learn things, and you know, this is this is kind of an incredible, you know, a 2006 style making that first video. You'll never imagine. Um, this year, I was, I was actually joking the kid that you know when I saw the Khan Academy logo next to the Pixar, I was like, the organization that makes the most low fidelity videos. <laughs> <laughs> so when you started, you kept on making lessons, but at some point you had to learn a lot yourself just to make sure you had something to go into it. Yeah, that's the fun of it. You know, actually, I mean, just this morning I made a video on. Um, um, ethanol fermentation, and like, I, and I learned I, I never knew this before, but it's now in the video that like you know yeast conducts ethanol fermentation, and you can get wine or beer, but obviously you're in bread too. But because of that, all bread has trace amounts of alcohol in it, which I never knew. But yeah, that's it's fun to learn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially about that, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. And apparently, sourdough bread has more, and they actually has a when they, after they bake it, there's a bunch of alcohol on top. I didn't know. <laughs> and uh, the other thing which is impressed with is you're providing tools for schools to help monitor how their students are doing. Yeah, I mean th this this goes back to the the you know the core of Khan Academy. Even those early days in 2005, when I was making tools for my cousins, I was their tutor, coach, whatever you want to call them, and I I wanted to see reports on how they were progressing, what they were having trouble on, how long it was taking them. And so the idea of teacher tools, or we call, call them coach tools, uh, on, has been there from day one. And so now, uh, you know, we have over a million teachers who are registered on Khan Academy, and they're using our coach resources. And we see, you know, there's a lot of talk in ed tech about, oh, you know, computers are this and this and that. And computers are an incredibly um, empowering thing. But what we see even at Khan Academy is the students who actually have coaches uh, and uh, engage on a human level, those students have 40% more activity on the side. So there's a, a huge human element. And a lot of what we try to do is, uh, how do we build the tools to empower the humans as opposed to somehow, you know, um, do it without the humans. But, you know, it's one of the things I remember when you saw Tony DeRose. Tony uh, is, is actually the head of our research group at uh, Pixar. Uh, and he's done a lot of phenomenal things over the years, but he's always had this passion that he's expressed many years ago that he wanted to use some of the things that we're doing to provide tools to teachers um, so they can help teach better. And uh, so many years later now, it's finally gotten to that point where there was this long-term passion. And for us, we had Pixar University, um, which is based on the belief that we all need to continue learning. So we started this group to uh, provide all kinds of classes to our employees. And there's kind of a logic. A lot of companies would say they've got universities because they're doing training of, of um, people in, in the management sense, or which we do too. But we also have a lot of it which is more exposure to other things that go on. It's just education for, for the sake of helping them um, look about things. And there's not, there's 
and they do it the correct job. But we also found early on, and this was kind of a surprise, but it was a wonderful thing, and that is the social act of people getting together caused interactions that didn't normally occur in work. So we've had this incredible benefit across the company by having what we call virtual university. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's, it's funny because, I mean, you, you may or may not appreciate I mean, we take huge inspiration from a lot of what y'all do. Uh, I mean, it might not be obvious that we do the quality of you know, what we're doing. <laughs> you know, you're every day. I mean, just how do you create creative things that can, you know, we use Pixar as an example of an organization that has scaled in a lot of ways, that has professionalized in a lot of ways, but still retains a deep connection with the, 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 the learner, the perceived, the, perceived, the, the user uh, in a very human way. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 you know, I hope we can learn more. Well, our, our roots are in academia. Uh, and in fact, for me personally, all the rest of my family is in education. My father was a math teacher and then a high school principal. Uh, my brothers and sisters, my mother, they were all in education. So I was a black sheep in the family. <laughs> didn't go into it, so I kind of make up for it. <laughs> and actually, there was a... Uh, a, a my whole family is still in the uh, it's good, it's good. Uh, you know, this company's full of comedians, so that's, 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 that's I love it. Uh, and when, when I was a kid, um, I, uh, in the first, I loved school all the way through, all the way up through, through college. And uh, so we rose out of academia, and part of it is um, I was involved with a wonderful program at college, and the way they ran it and thought and recruited people was inspirational to me, and I wanted to continue that. But I, there's one thing that drove me and had to do with when I was a child, which was that I, I liked science and I liked art. Um, I was in this high school, that's 700 person high school, um, I was the best artist. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to be an animator uh, for Disney. Um, and when I graduated from high school, I realized I didn't know how to get to the next level. There were no schools for animation. And my abilities at that time were nowhere near what I saw. I, mean, I, I, I couldn't conceive of bridging that gap, so I switched over into physics. <laughs> <laughs> that seemed very easy. <laughs> but the, the thing is, I have, you know, I, I told it in that way, and the first time I told that story, I mean, it is what happened, but the first time I told the story, I got that same kind of response, and so I continue to tell the story, and there's always sort of a chitter in the audience as a result of that. Because it's it's thought of, and I said it because I thought of it as, in, in, uh, as, as being incongruous. And then I realized, this is actually a problem, is that almost all of us think of the art and the science as being incongruous. What I loved was actually to put them together. But there's a sort of deep misconception in the schools about it. And as we know, the, when, when school funding gets cut, one of the first things to go are the art programs. And, and for me, I just feel like this is disastrous because art is about learning to see, it's about learning to draw. And, and because people misperceive that, they think, well, it isn't uh, a valuable enough to teach a lot of people how to draw. So as soon as you reach that conclusion, you say, why would I fund the programs for that? But if you think of it in terms of how do I help people see? Mm -hmm. Then in which profession is it not important that we develop our ability to see and observe what's going on? And I, and I think you know what, what's interesting about that is the, seeing the value of art, but I think it's on the other side. I mean, what, what, what kills me a lot of times is you meet someone who's incredibly creative and say, oh, I'm not into math or science or engineering, I'm creative. And you say, that's what engineering is, it's creating things. And, and I think a lot of it comes from <laughs> The way that we evaluate students in middle school, early high school, where, you know, can you factor the polynomial this week? And if you can't, you kind of moved off into a different direction. And the analogy is, is evaluating someone's artistic potential based on how well they mix paint when they are, you know, in, in middle school. Or uh, someone's potential to be a great dancer based on how flexible they might be in, in middle school. And I think that's what's neat about it, is by mixing both, you get both. You get on the art side, you see that it's, it is about how to see in a way of thinking. And on the engineering and math side, you realize, okay, these are just tools to express creativity. So yeah, it's, it's a very exciting thing. Well, I, I, to me, it's a very important topic because people 
do define creativity with way too many problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and there are people who actually do include creativity, include the engineering and, and so forth. But that's still too narrow. Is that creativity is about solving problems. Okay? We may have problems in our personal life, in our family, with our relationships, in our job. And we have to think our way and be smart about how we solve these problems. And it's the solving of the problems that's it's creativity. Um, and because people misperceive of it, they don't think of it as being creative, they kind of get stuck or, they, or they're fearful. They feel like they're going to be judged. And one of the, uh, the great things about education, and, and I think great teachers do this, is they're trying to free people up to think of things and create solutions and remove the barriers. When we, uh, I think when they misdefine uh, creativity or art, then what we're doing is we're creating barriers that make it harder for people to learn. And, we're, and what we want to do is make it easier. And in our case, we're, we're making films to touch the world, but it ties into our passion that we want to help with education because if you do that right, you do touch the world. And to me, that's the wonderful thing about Khan Academy is it's touching millions of people. And when you do that, you are making a big difference in the world. And I mean, you know, it, maybe to state the obvious, but what's super exciting about this for us is Pixar, to a large degree, and this isn't an overstatement, is defining culture for a, you know for a, for for this generation and probably many generations to come. And so I think it's a neat thing for us to be able to start to think together about how can we leverage our our the assets, how we can bring them together, so that we can. You know, one thing that I've always appreciated about Pixar films is that, you know, there's a lot of successful films out there, but it always feels like there's a, a little bit something extra that maybe didn't have to happen for the commercial success of the movie, but it happened anyway. Because it's kind of socialized at the organization that there's almost a, 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 a moral imperative to kind of put something out there that will actually elevate the conversation or elevate how people think. I was excited for this. And I'm curious, I mean, to what degree do you think about that when you make when you produce films, you know, there's the, the commercial bar, which you can meet, and then going above that. Well, uh, we think a lot about it. Um, and, and, and one of the, uh, the, the fundamental principles, which I think a lot of people misperceive, has to do with storytelling. Um, well, there is storytelling. We like to watch movies, or we like to read books, uh, or we think of uh, the fact that we learn we read to our children. So this is all storytelling. Um, but we also have storytelling in, in the news. But in fact, it's broader than that. Storytelling is the way we communicate with each other. And when we make these personal connections, we convey more. And that's what we want to do as part of our network of being interconnected as, as people. It's really important to understand that storytelling and creativity are broader than these narrow boxes that people put them in. Um, and part of what makes a story work is if you can actually connect with somebody emotionally. So if, it's, if they think of it as dry, they disconnect from it. And there are movies, and there are some action movies, and there's some movies where people just go to laugh or to watch the action. And, and all that's fine. But I think the more compelling thing is when you actually connect with some emotion. So when we pick a director, for instance, we never start with a, an idea and ask them to um, uh, a director to, to take that idea. We in, in, instead pick a director and say, we want you to come up with an idea. And we say to them, we want you to come up with three ideas. And the reason we say three is because they can get stuck. But there's an interesting phenomenon when they do three ideas. If they work on these ideas and they come back later, they're going to pitch them. And they start off by saying, um, I love all these ideas equally. <laughs> now they're lying for you. <laughs> so, like we had one film recently where um, there were the three ideas and so on. On one wall there are all the ideas and, and the artwork for, for, for one of the film ideas. And it's the concepts and what they're doing. It's not, it's not the whole idea, it's just the general direction. And the other wall different idea and some characters and some artwork. Um, and then in this case, because uh, there are only 
two long walls in the room, we had to go to the other room to see the third wall. So we go in the other room. Both walls and ceiling are filled with our wooden tables. <laughs> so without knowing what the pitch was, we knew, okay, we know which film we're making because it's driven by the passion. And that's what we want in the films, is the passion. Now, it's still really hard, it's difficult, we have failures and missteps all along the way, but at the, at the base level of it, it's about passion, and that passion turns into emotion, and that's the kind of thing that connects. That's the most important thing for us. And, and do you all think about, I, I mean, this notion that a large percentage of people between certain ages, or actually all ages, are going to see this thing and be probably emotionally affected by this, that there is this opportunity to kind of elevate their, I, I, I mean, is that part of the, uh, or, or is that just naturally happen to good storytelling? Well, I, I think it's part of good storytelling. And now, in our case, uh, clearly there, there are good stories which are for adults only. This isn't going to touch the hearts of young kids. <laughs> or, or have, I mean, there's some great movies there. Uh, and in our case, we are trying to be proud of what we do. Uh, but I think it was, it was interesting because Walt Disney expressed it very well. He said they're trying to, he, he's trying to touch the child inside of each one of us. And, and I thought it was just a great statement. Um, and, and I think about education the same way, is that, that in the child we're expected to, to learn, we want them to learn. And then at some point, the point where some people don't think their job is to learn anymore. And which I think is unfortunate because we always want to learn throughout our entire lives. <laughs> you learn by teaching, right? Yeah, no, I, I feel like I have the best job. I mean, well now when I meet you, I think we have the second best job. <laughs> yeah, I mean every day you get to work, I mean obviously you get to work with great people, but then obviously even you know be able to do direct contribution, learn about on the trace face amounts of alcohol and sourdough bread and, <laughs> and all of the rest. Uh, but yeah, I think I think it's a huge opportunity. I think the fact that we have media, the types of things that Pixar does, the types of things that Khan Academy do, does, it, it, it would have been hard even a generation ago to say, we can